Good evening and welcome to episode 22 of African Football HQ. Uh, today, Malik and I are going to be looking ahead to the North London Derby on Sunday, examining the African impact the anticipated action in that match. We're also going to be discussing some of the top performers, the top African performers in European football this week. And we're also going to be paying tribute to the late Papa Bouba Diop, a Senegal legend who tragically passed away at 42 this week. Malik, let's start by looking at Sunday's North London showdown between Premier League leaders, Tottenham Hotspur, and an Arsenal side who are going nowhere fast. We can't really focus on this game without looking at Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang, who is enjoying, enduring a miserable season. Um, we'll talk about the stats a little bit later and, and, and other areas that might be going wrong. But what's your kind of gut feeling about why Aubameyang is struggling this season? Throughout most of the season, I've been telling you that it's because he's playing out on the wing, but we started to see him at strike a little bit. I'm still not sure if that's solving the issue. Against Wolves, he had a very lackluster performance, missed a lot of chances. I feel like something else is wrong, Ed. You talk about the positioning, but I mean, at Dortmund, he often played in a wide area, cut inside, and, and found the net effectively that way. At the end of last season at Arsenal, he was playing in that similar role on the left flank cutting inside onto his right foot. So I don't know if we can just say that it is the position that is, that is having the impact. And like you said, even when he's been, he's been operating in a more central role, uh, things haven't been going smoothly for him. So this season so far in 10 games, he's scored twice. He's not scored from open play since the opening day against Fulham. The only goal that's come since then has been from the penalty spot uh, against Manchester United. It's, he's averaging a goal every five games in the league. It's absolutely disastrous return. And I think we have to look at his body language. We've got to look at his confidence. We've got to look at his overall application as well, because I don't think he, he's, um, I think he's a player who is often criticised that maybe he, he didn't offer much beyond goal scoring. And that's all well and good when you're banging in winners. But if you're not even goal scoring, then I think you have to adapt. You have to offer something a little bit different than he is doing. I want to ask, Ed, do you think it was right for him to stay at Arsenal? I feel like part of this loss of motivation might be that he's sort of hit the end of the road. At this point, he's not going to move to a Real Madrid or a club with, high, with higher aspirations in Arsenal. Is that the reason why he's lost motivation? I, I, I really don't, I don't think it is because he kind of knew what he was getting. I mean, we, if maybe if Thomas Partey hadn't arrived, you could have said, OK, well, it's the same old Arsenal, lacking ambition, not willing to open the purse strings a little bit in the summer. But actually, Partey came. There's optimism around the place. Mikel Arteta is a, is a bright, young, proactive manager. Nicola Pepe, we started to see last season what he's capable of. I think there, was, there were reasons for Aubameyang to start to believe in the project. But I think now, after Arteta was heralded at the end of last season, people now are starting to question whether he's even the right guy. Is he, is he even a competent manager? And certainly, you look at Arsenal this season, they've lost five of their 10 Premier League games. They've only won four. And like you said, the Wolves game was was dismal. They were out of ideas. They were lethargic. It was hard to pick out, apart from Gabriel's header, it was hard to pick out anything that was really positive about their performance. Yeah, I feel like you're starting to hint at the fact that it's not just Aubameyang's fault that they're in 13th place. Like, There's a lot of issues going on at the club, many of which are probably too great for him to solve. Yeah, I mean, the, the defence has improved since Emery's time. Uh, the midfield is looking a bit more solid at times. I mean, Jacques is not a liability. El Neni, we've, we've praised him, but he's maybe a kind of a plan B that's coming good rather than... Calm down, plan- calm down. Respect him. Well, no, I mean, like, listen, I think, I think in, in... I know you're a massive El Neni fan and you've got your poster up on the wall, but I think in, <laughs> when, when Arteta planned this season, he probably wasn't planning for El Neni to be one of the, the major positives of the campaign, was it? Yeah. But uh, we can talk about him later. But just to finish with the bombing, when he is playing striker, he's not getting good links up, link ups with any players. With whether it's Lacazette, it's not working out. They're throwing in tons of crosses from the wing, but he's just not connecting. He'll either miss, get the header and miss it, or just won't hit at all. Something's going on with the play style, who he's playing with. And you talked about this before we started recording, Ed. But is Mesut Ozil the missing piece? Is could he solve Aubameyang's issues? Oh, it's such a kind of easy story, isn't it? And I can see why people are jumping on that bandwagon. I can see why Paul Merson is saying that now with Party in the team, you've got a workhorse in there, you've got someone who can allow Ozil to express himself and flourish. But 
I don't know. I just think that, that Arteta was praised, rightly praised, for taking a hard line with Ozil and for putting the ethos of the team, the unity of the group ahead of one man's whims and his, his particular idiosyncrasies. Um, and now we're criticising him for doing that because things aren't going well and we're talking about bringing Ozil back. But imagine with six months to go of Ozil's contract, drafting him back into the team in January. It completely undermines Arteta. It completely undermines the, the plans and the project and the initiatives he had at the beginning. Is, is this really what you're advocating? They're in 13th place. We've seen some clubs sack their manager in this position. Arteta probably shouldn't be too, too upset if he just has to bring back a player to save his job. But imagine, I mean, if it worked, imagine the criticism Arteta gets. If it doesn't I, work, imagine the criticism Arteta's going to get. He's got to, I think he's got to be He's strong, put himself he's in a bad say, position. I think, yeah, I think, I think, on one hand, I agree with you because if you've got a player who's earning that much money. You've got to try and make this asset work for you. But at the same time, he's put such big stock in the unity of the group and the idea of these guys working for each other. And if you've got a guy in there like Ozil who is, who is diluting that focus, then it's going to make everyone else weaker, I think. And, and therefore, I completely understand where he was coming from. You've even had guys like Thierry Henry praising specifically this decision, saying that Arteta needed to be his own man. He needed to make the tough calls. And I think at the end of last season, when things were largely as they were now, except without party, we weren't talking about Ozil. And it's only now that if Aubameyang was firing, if he was putting away those chances like he has done for the last six years of his career, we wouldn't be talking about Ozil in this way. I think Aubameyang, I think, if, he's, if he's playing to his top level, we're not having this conversation. I think from a tactical perspective, taking out Ozil and then in some cases where Arteta will replace him with a cam such as Joe Willock, he's not experienced enough to be calling for the ball, collecting the ball and distributing it out. So in those positions where we have where there is an unexperienced player, so young like Willick playing in Cam, the creative focus goes to Aubameyang, whether he's on the wing or at striker. So all these balls are getting sent to him if he can even get into a position. And it's just not working out. So he can't be the creative focus. He needs to have someone, kind of like what you hinted at. Well, I think Party will be able to free Ozil, but Ozil should also free Aubameyang, if that kind of makes sense. I think it, that triangle could work very well. So you're writing off Sebaios. You don't think he could be the guy to unlock... Aubameyang, you, you think William already time have, to move on from that experiment? And what about Pepe? I mean, we spent seventy-two million on this guy, and we're saying that you can be Arsenal in the team too. Fire. Sorry, he can be in the team too. Know, got, Pepe, we're expecting a little bit more from seventy-two million, to, to, then we have to keep on relying on Urzel. I mean, yeah. I think I think maybe it's just, you know we're both kind of coming to the conclusion it's not just one specific problem that is causing this overall disaster. But at the same time, I think just saying it's Ozil, it, it, it's really, it, it's, it's too easy a narrative, I think, for me. Just to hit on your Ceballos point, I want to state that I will have an agenda against 90% of the players who start over El Nini. So Ceballos, Shaka, they're not in my good books. Why can't we all work together, Malik? Why can't you play Ceballos as a, the most advanced midfielder in a midfield three, ahead of Party and El Nini, and then problem solved, right? Ozil was the best, one of the best creative players in Real Madrid this past decade. Ceballos couldn't even get in the team. But that's all yeah, I but you're say. remembering, this is what people do. They remember Ozil fondly with rose-tinted glasses. Even when he played, people were slagging him off for being disinterested, for not influencing games, for just doing one magical moment every, every two matches. It's not, it's not enough at this level. It's not enough when you're looking to compete for the title, compete for the Champions League. If you're going to be that kind of luxury player, you need to have soldiers around him. And Aubameyang is not the kind of soldier who you can pair with Urza and expect magic to happen, I'm afraid. We talked a ton about Arsenal, but they will be facing Spurs, who are top of the table, as you previously said, Ed. What's going on with them? Yeah, it's important to remember it's not all doom and gloom in North London. I know you're kind of getting used to Arsenal being in the bottom half of the table. They kind of suit it. They suit hovering around the 13th mark. It kind of <laughs> works out. No, I think, no, I think it's a good look for them. It's a good look. Um, but it's not all doom and gloom in North London at the moment because, as you mentioned, as, you know, as we've talked about extensively, uh, Tottenham are top of the table. Uh, Jose Mourinho, this project that was never going to work, is actually working better than many people, if, if not anybody, had expected. Um, he's getting the best out of Tanguy Dembele, which people had not anticipated after last season's horror show. 
Uh, Hoiberg has come in as a marvellous addition, and we have to give immense credit to Serge Aurier. In the past, you've used words like clown, uh, kamikaze <laughs> to describe him. Uh, you've called him reckless. You called him a liability that time, and I said that you were being a little bit precipitous. But look at him now. I mean, look at the way the guy's performing. You've got to admit, Aurier deserves immense credit, right? I'm a bit shocked by the accusations you threw at me. But I wasn't expecting him to have a good season, to be fair, especially with the signing of Matt Doherty from Wolves. It seemed like it was kind of the end for Aurier, especially hearing from a lot of Spurs fans, maybe not yourself, that Aurier wasn't the best at crossing, might be maybe a defensive liability, and that a more solidified Premier League force such as Matt Doherty, who's been established for maybe two seasons at Wolves, could be better than the former PSG defender. But... Uh, according to you, Doherty has COVID, so to Aurier's possible delight, he will be starting in the massive game. But he's he's had good performances against the top six, hasn't he, Ed? Yeah, I mean, you can even go back to kind of offensively that that demolition of Manchester United, which was very enjoyable, by the way. Uh, Aurier's performance going forward as the Red Devils were torn apart was a delight. That's obviously that side of his game, which we, we knew about and which, which Mourinho has harnessed. Then also defensively, he played his part in, in clean sheets against Manchester City, uh, the nil-nil draw with Chelsea last weekend, as Tottenham extended their undefeated streak to nine games. Uh, and particularly his performance against Ferran Torres, where he uh, completed five tackles, four clearances, really relished the kind of one-on-one combat. Um, I think we're definitely seeing defensive improvement from Aurier. So to conclude our North London special segment, Malik, uh, let's look ahead to Sunday's game and give us your big, bold African prediction for the match. Despite all of the bashing of Aubameyang or whatever the surroundings we've done, I do think he'll score, even if they do lose. And I will say that Elneny will have a good performance, especially considering how Shaka and Sabayos are pretty poor against Wolves. And I'm not guessing that both of them will stay in the team. So Elneny will come in, he'll have a good performance as always, then leave the team for a few weeks. And uh, maybe a Tanganga goal off the header. If he does play, we'd like to give a quick shout out to freelance football opportunities. They are a paid newsletter that gives you, if you're an aspiring writer, videographer, or whatever, and you want to work with football journalism, they're a newsletter you can sign up for and they give you the latest on job openings. They can fit you for what you're qualified for. Overall, I think it's a great website. That's why we're suggesting it to you. So give it a look. It will be in the description. Looking ahead to the other games in the Premier League this weekend, we have a fascinating matchup between Manchester City and Fulham, both of whom got big wins last weekend and both of whom were inspired by African players to get all three points. Malik, I'm of course talking about Riyad Mahrez and Adamola Lukman. Which of the pair impressed you most last weekend? Well, we have to go with Riyad Mahrez, getting another Premier League hat-trick, uh, really getting off the mark for this season. Great performance overall. Makes you wonder. It just, he always gl- gives those glimpses of joy, but when he really gets a great performance out like that, he's given, he's given the start and he capitalizes on a t- poor team. <laughs> he's able to, to really show us what he's about, that he is one of the best wingers in world football. I think you have to agree with that, Ed. I mean, based on the evidence of the Burnley game, obviously you have to agree with that. But when you consider that in his previous 12 games... He'd scored only one and contributed another assist. Uh, that's just simply not good enough, especially in this Man City team with the options, the, the, the players he has buzzing around him. I just don't think you can really be saying he's one of the best wingers in the world game when he's had such a poor record in the preceding matches. But in or terms of ability, we've well, seen yeah, him without Jerry. Ability, uh... ability, there's loads. I mean... Jeremy Bogger of Sassuolo is a fantastic player in terms of ability. No one can dribble like him, but he's he did more in his previous games than Mares did in his in his previous twelve matches. Uh, I'm an advocate that Mares should move to a different club where he can have the spotlight. But even in a limited uh, chance, maybe he Burnley. To City. He'd have the spotlight at Burnley. <laughs> where would you send him? Where would you send Mares to have the spotlight? Pepe for Mares swap. Could that be on the cards? Oh, Manchester well. United would be really good, to be fair. Him instead of Sancho? Yeah, I could see that. I could, what, about, what about Tottenham? Son, yeah, Son they have the good, yeah, I like Bergwijn, though. I, mm. I, I didn't realize the Man City to Man United switch. <laughs> well, it wouldn't be the first time. Yeah, but in uh, highest probability, it would be a move to France and PSG, I have to say. 
Welsh winger Bill Meredith was another uh, individual uh, genius who played for both Manchester clubs and someone maybe uh, like Mares, who not everyone was a fan of his style, but he uh, he certainly ended up winning over both sets of supporters. But you've got to admit, I think he, we both, of, both of us can agree that in terms of technical ability, flair, flamboyance, creativity, Mares is is a sensational player. But he has great end product too. Like you're talking about him, like he's some skiller, but his end product well, is amazing. He's got he's got he got one goal in the previous twelve matches. He got only one assist. Compare that with with Ziyech against. Uh, Sheffield United alone, Ziyech was simply sensational. A lot, you know, Burnley and Sheffield United are struggling, so lots of players perhaps could do it against those two at the moment. But in terms of Ziyech versus Mares, what both of them have, have done so far this season, I mean, I think only one of those two is world class at this stage. At this stage, obviously, yes, we can't we can't necessarily throw him into that category after just one hat trick. But you have to think. In a different situation, I'm really confident he could be matching Ziyech or any of these top attackers. Yeah, but Alan, Alan St. Maximin of Newcastle, if you put him into the Man City team, do you think he would have done more in his previous 12 games than Mahrez has? He's a very talented player, very eye-catching, lovely, <laughs> lovely at beating a man. You know, I watched, him, I watched him live at Nice against Toulouse and he was simply unplayable. Do you not think if you put him in a slightly different... I think you, that, that, that argument works if it's about a player who's playing at... Um, at Boreham Wood but it doesn't work quite so well if it's a player playing at Man City where he's surrounded by elite players yeah not not even necessarily just that they're elite but they have so many class wingers and then in the middle of the park Kevin De Bruyne he can't Riyad Mahrez can't be the focus of that team so I think a lot of the reasons why we don't see him start is because he's not able to play as best as he can if he's not the main focus I don't know. I think it has a little bit more to do with perhaps his uh, inability to influence the biggest matches, as we saw in the FA Cup semi-final. Uh, you didn't see his goal yeah. against Zimbabwe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no. I mean, Zimbabwe, very, you know, very talented outfit. But I don't, I don't think maybe that uh, doing it against Zimbabwe compensates for failing to do it against Arsenal in that semi-final. He then wasn't trusted against Lyon in the Champions League, uh, the decisive Champions League game. And I think ultimately, uh, Guardiola, like sadly large portions of the Man City fan base, are actually losing faith in him as a, as a consistent game changer, unfortunately. Hopefully, the game against Burnley can, can prompt a few people to uh, reevaluate their opinions. Move on to Fulham now. Ed, I'm sure you're aware I'm a bit of a stats buff. I have one stat for you Fulham are one for four on penalties this season in the Premier League. It makes Adam Lookman's look. It makes Lookman's miss look not that bad. Yeah, I think maybe if Mitrovic had been fit and firing, their record would be slightly better because he uh, Lookman, too. Lookman, true, but Lookman and Ivan Cavallero, both of whom missed, although Cavallero did score against uh, Leicester, they are not the uh, Fulham's primary uh, penalty taker. But anyway, why are you focusing on? You talk about Lookman, you're focusing on the negatives. Let's talk about the positives. You're you're well, focusing you, you on can't, that. You can't see him do anything without thinking about that penalty miss. It's going to plague him for the rest, the next three seasons at least, no matter what he does. I would have agreed with you if he hadn't responded in such style. But uh, Lookman in his last two games has contributed as many goals as Mares did in his previous 12 games before <laughs> that Burnley match. He got an assist against, uh, against Everton as Fulham fell to a 3-2 defeat against his former club. And then he scored the opening goal after some sensational work from Zamba and Guisa uh, as Fulham defeated Leicester. Their second win of the season and out of the relegation zone. And I think you have to give credit to, to the Fulham defence, Scott Parker's work with this team, but also his faith in Lookman and, and Lookman's bounce back ability after that, that horror performance against, uh, against West Ham United. Because yes. Leicester players, they would, have, they would have, shoulders would have gone down, attitude wouldn't have been right, they'd have dwelt on that, but he's rolled his socks up and is performing better than ever. When I saw the transfer that he was going to a Premier League team on loan, I really didn't think it was right for him, especially a team that just clawed its way back like Fulham. I really didn't think he would be getting this much attention and this many chances to right his wrongs. So I was surprised to see him starting early in the season when he missed the penalty or maybe he wasn't firing early in the season. I think he might have lost his chance. But I don't know whether it's his skill or Scott Parker's desperation that he's still playing an interval role in this team. What do you mean? Listen to the, uh, listen to the emotion behind that. What do you mean Scott Parker's desperation? He wanted to play on the counter-attack. He needed 
fast, incisive players to do that against the Leicester team. He knew. Well, you have to remember, he had like less than ten mad professional matches before this period. I have to think. I have to think. What do you mean? Like, he didn't get that much play time at Everton. He didn't play at all at Leipzig, basically. And then he's thrown oh, he's into more than ten game. games. He's played. He's played much more than ten games. What do you mean? He, he's not. He's not. He's not wet behind the ears anymore. He's in his early twenties now. It is his time to shine in the Premier League. I was like you. I wasn't sure that Fulham was the right move for him. I, I remember seeing Jean Jean Seri uh, completely throw his career away at Fulham after moving from Nice, and I, I feared that if they were getting battered each week and if they weren't able to control games, that he might not get the opportunity. But he's answering the critics, and and I think. Uh, that penalty miss you're talking about is, is, is the, the horror moment we'll always see. I think it could be the turning point. It could be the moment when he really became mature and started to take responsibility and started to take better decisions. And and Parker stuck with him. And imagine what that will mean for him to have overcome that obstacle in his career, to have overcome that miserable moment and to have made it a launch pad for, for bigger and better things. I think it might have forgotten if they got relegated. <laughs> right. Perhaps I think I think if they're relegated by one point, I think we'll be talking about it for decades. But um, <laughs> I'm much more confident about Fulham's chances now. I really like Ola Aina. I like Adarabio as well. There's a real African seam in that team. Park is getting a lot out of players who have never been at this level before, and also Zambor and I mean, he, he was on loan at Villarreal last season, linked to Real Madrid. And I love midfielders who contribute both defensively and offensively because they make everyone around them better. They protect the defence and they can get the most out of, out of the strikers. And uh, Zambra Nguisa is really proving to be this kind of all-around midfielder. He's, he's protecting those behind him. But as we saw from that sensational assist for Lukman's opening goal, um, he's also very capable of contributing at the other end as well. You talked about the Zambra Nguisa assist to Lukman. It was an all-African goal, especially for the celebration, wasn't it? Yes, uh, Luke been paying tribute to the late Papabuba Diop, uh, who we're going to talk about later, uh, by holding up his Senegal shirt with number 19 on. It was a, a poignant moment. I wonder, I'd love to know whether that was just Luke Quinn's choice to have done that celebration or whether it was pre-planned by Fulham to honour one of their former players and whoever had scored would have, would have celebrated like that. I like to think that it was Luke Quinn and his self-awareness, but, um, but I don't know. Yeah, we're... I would like to think so, but we don't really see the Nigerian Senegalese connection too often. I was kind of thinking, like, what's the link there? So when you brought up Fulham, I might have thought that it might have been orchestrated by them, and they gave it to the the one African attacker they have. I don't know. I wonder if Mitrovic had scored the opening goal. I mean, he <laughs> if he'd scored, would he have also held it? Uh, I'm not sure. Could you imagine? I'd make that the the cover page of African Football HQ. Mitrovic in a Senegal jersey. I like to think it was uh, it was Lukman's own initiative, but I'll I'll try and ask someone at the club which which, uh, which way around it was. We'll conclude our Premier League talk with one more London club in Chelsea. They've had a ton of great African performers, namely two in Edward Mendy and Hakim Ziyech. Ed, which one has really caught the eye for you? Well, you and I have, have been cheerleaders for both of these guys over the last few weeks and months, and uh, I think we. We both predicted accurately that they would be success stories at Stamford Bridge. I've been particularly impressed by Mendy, uh, both for his performances in and of themselves, but also for what his arrival has meant for that Chelsea defence. Um, he got a clean sheet at the weekend, which means he now has five clean sheets in six league games for Chelsea, which remarkably, despite only playing six out of ten matches, is more than uh, any other keeper in the top division. Um, and certainly when you compare with the hapless performances of Kepa Arizabalaga and Willy Caballero, uh, he has been a massive upgrade. Yeah, yeah, he's just been perfect. Like, I have nothing bad to say about him. <laughs> Let's move on to no, the even another clean sheet against Sevilla at the week, uh, in midweek as Chelsea went 4-0 to qualify in top spot from their group in the Champions League. So Mendy has been... Uh, I mean, maybe Petr Cech is the best uh, football scout in the business right now because... Uh, it was his strong recommendation to go back to his former club, Ren, and to sign uh, Mendy for Chelsea. So it's it's proving to be a masterstroke. I think by definition, we have to call it the best transfer so far out of the whole window because he hasn't put a foot wrong yet, has he? Uh, that's a big shout. I think 
He hasn't put a foot wrong, but I think also the arrival of Thiago Silva has, has made a big difference to that defence. Suddenly you have a cool, calm head in there and you have a goalkeeper behind who is uh, more uh, authoritative and more commanding. And I think the combination of those two together has really underpinned Chelsea's uh, defensive improvement. Best signing of the summer? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe too early to say, but um, ask me again at the end of uh, 2020 and we can uh, decide on that one. All right. Well, they made two signings in the attack, Hakim Ziyech and Timo Werner. One of them has been playing poorly. One of them has been on top of their game. Werner's pretty bad as of now, I have to say. Ziyech, on the other hand, you brought him up earlier in the Mara's debate. He's playing excellently. The African football fraternity was saddened this past week to learn the death of Senegalese midfielder Papa Bouba Diop at the young age of 42 following a young illness. Ed, most of his uh, glory days were before my were before my time, so can you enlighten the fans and myself on what he did and what he contributed to football? Well, he's best known for his kind of greatest moment, which was scoring the winning goal, the only goal of the game for Senegal as they defeated France 1-0 in the opening game of the 2002 World Cup. And this was really uh, one of, if not the biggest World Cup shock of all time, certainly up there with Cameroon's victory over Argentina in the opening game of the 1990 World Cup. I think a case could be made that the Senegal uh, victory was even more shocking. It was their first ever game uh, in the tournament, whereas Cameroon were already previous AFCON winners. They'd been at the World Cup in 1982. Whereas this was Senegal's first game. They were playing an imperious France team who were both world champions and European champions who had the likes of Thierry Henry, Zinedine Zidane, although he was injured, Marcel Desai. Um, whereas Senegal were, were largely a team of unknowns, all of whom, apart from the reserve goalkeeper, played in France, um, but none of them had anything like the kind of stature of the French team. Um, and that was a very exciting Senegal team, a very exciting run to the World Cup quarterfinal. Uh, Bubba Diop ended up scoring uh, two more goals against Uruguay in a thrilling 3-3 draw, their final group stage game. Uh, before Senegal bowed out against Turkey in the quarterfinals. And he was really one of the uh, symbols, one of the, the key figures in this, uh, this team. I think one of the greatest uh, years we've ever seen from an African team, 2002 in Senegal, as they reached the AFCON final in Mali and also reached the quarterfinal of the World Cup. So international level, that was his, his crowning glory, definitely. What about club level? We know we talked about him playing in the Premier League. What did he achieve for club? So after making the breakthrough at uh, ASC DRF in, in Senegal, he moved to Switzerland. He played for the likes of Neuchâtel, uh, Zamax, and also Grasshoppers, where he was a Swiss champion. Then he moved to Lens in France. And in 2002, he was runner-up in Ligue 1. That was obviously the same year as he played for, for Senegal in the World Cup. And then he moved to English football, where he would basically spend the rest of his career, apart from a brief spell in Greece, where he won the Greek Cup. Um, best known for his time at Fulham, uh, where he got the nickname The Wardrobe for his... Uh, imposing uh, presence. He's six foot, he was six foot five. Um, but he was a very fair player, very strong, very hard to play against, but very fair. Uh, Paul Scholes actually once named Diop among his, his toughest ever opponents. Um, but I think his, his, his finest achievement at club level was probably with Harry Redknapp's Portsmouth, where he was a member of the team that won the Epic Cup in, in 2008. Then he played for West Ham and finally uh, ended his career with, with Birmingham. And it's... Um, Massive loss, I think, an underrated player during his time, um, key figure for Senegal, and uh, yes, had to, had, to, had to lose him at, at such an early age. Malik, I want to talk to you about Egyptian football, about Al Ali, our new African champions, and about Pizzo Mosamane. Uh, last week, you hosted, uh, I was very disappointed I missed out on the African Football HQ uh, Egyptian panel show, where you talked to the guys about the CAF Champions League final. Obviously, Ali ended up winning that game. Tell us about the final. Tell us about how Mo Samane masterminded this triumph. And also tell us about some of the other things he's been achieving in Egypt since. It was a great game. I think, unfortunately, the fans weren't there. So that put myself off for a bit. But the goals were amazing. And Chikabala still has it. The Swan Ronaldo put in a beautiful curler with his left foot to equalize the game. The game was a stalemate until the 85th minute when Mohamed Mengdi Efsha, in his second season at the club, scored a rocket half volley from outside the box to send Cairo into quarantine flames. We don't, there weren't too many celebrations outside, but on Twitter, 
Ahli was Ahli fans are going crazy as they lifted their ninth Champions League. It was a great feat for everyone involved, especially Pizza Mosimane, who we previously mentioned. Uh, we talked about on that episode whether he deserved all the credit for this win, considering how Rene Weiler um, took them far in the league and in the Champions League. But you should be proud of how they handled themselves against Casablanca in the semifinals and then in the finals against Zemelik. Obviously, the absence of fans changed the complexion of the game, but were there scenes of celebration in Cairo after the match, or did people largely observe the, the quarantine uh, guide, the, the social distancing guidelines? And also, am I right in thinking that Mahmoud Dia of goal, one of your guest panellists, correctly predicted a 2-1 victory for Ali with Afshar scoring the winner? I think so. Well, we might have to play that clip. Great, great achievement for goal. I wish you were as good as your colleague of making some predictions. Well, no, I'm pretty good with the predictions. Pretty good, actually, with the predictions. Well, there were some fireworks on the street and the, the cars honking, as always. Some viral videos came out, but overall, it seemed a lot of the people did stay at home. But Twitter was the real battleground. Besides the field where there was a fight, uh, Kasongo karate kicked an Ahli player after the full-time whistle, and there was a little skirmish, but Ahli's joy overrode that moment as they uh, lifted the trophy a few minutes later. So a bit chaotic, you would have hoped, given the match of the century or match of the millennium, that it would be better. But I, I was satisfied, given the circumstances. I don't know if it's a slight up upgrade for African football to go from uh, VAR not working and overshadowing the 2019 final to a, a karate kick in the, in the 2020 final. It seems like a, it's kind of par for the course. And um, can you tell us a little bit about what Moussa Moussamani has been doing domestically as well? Because it's been very much back to work this week after the, uh, the African success. Yes, he is, uh, he's going for history as they defeated Al Ittihad of Alexandria in the Cup semifinals where they will face Talal Geish. They were expected to face Zemelik in a rematch of the Champions League final, but Talal Geish defeated them. Who all, they also defeated Pyramids in the quarterfinals. So they're a bit of a dark horse that have gone a lot farther than a lot of people would have expected. But against Ahli, they'll be facing arguably the greatest team in Africa. And we will look at them as one of the greatest teams in African history in a few years. If we do that goal series again, Ed, maybe we'll highlight them. But you one in the top five, yeah. Yeah. So they will be going for the, uh, for the tr Egyptian trouble. But for Pizzo Mosimane, this is even more important because this could be his sixth trophy this season. He won the trouble with Sundowns. He won two cups and the PSL. Came to Egypt, finished off the league, finished off the Champions League. And now with this Egyptian cup, he can get six trophies in one season. I don't think that's ever been done by a manager before, Ed. Potential replacement for Arteta at Arsenal, do you think? It's a good one. I'd love to see that. Imagine he just plays all the Africans. He can bring in Thembozwane to replace Ozil. It's good stuff. Wallet Solomon to replace, uh, to replace Abamyang on the left, perhaps move Abamyang in the centre. This is episode 22 of the African Football HQ podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. We talked about it a lot. Be on the lookout for next week's episode. Goodbye. Don't miss Tottenham's win in the North London derby as well.